Hi, and welcome back to the History Lessons in Edupedia World. This lesson we're going to do today complements the second part of the lesson on the concentration camps of Japanese Americans during the Second World War. The uh, material that is available is so vast we are only going to center ourselves in one of the camps, the camp of Manzanar. We are taking the example of three photographers, Dorothea Lange, Ansel Adams and Toyo Miyatake. And as we said in the last lesson, photography was very important. So what we're going to do is through their work, we'll be seeing different points of view on the events and the objectives they had, what was the aim with this photography and we'll try to understand a bit the bigger picture with the material that has been left from that period. First of all, let's just do a quick overview in some information on Manzanar. The weather in this area caused great suffering to the prisoners because they were mostly used to milder temperatures and remember they were staying in wooden huts they were not prepared to shelter people in such conditions. The temperatures in this desert area are really hot in summer, up to 100 Fahrenheit, 38 Celsius, and get really cold in winter. We're talking about 40 Fahrenheit, 4 Celsius. Winters occasionally actually brought snowfall and it snowed during the time the uh, camps were active and they also had a big issue with strong winds there it's as we said it's desert like and the strong winds just covered everything with dust sometimes the prisoners woke up in the morning covered from head to toe with a fine layer of dust and they just had to constantly sweep dirt out of the barracks and off all their possessions. A former Manzanar prisoner, Rolf Lazo, said in the summer the heat was unbearable. In the winter the sparsely rationed oil didn't adequately heat the tar paper covered pine barracks with knot holes in the floor. The wind would just blow so hard it would toss rocks around. So the conditions were really, really tough for just these normal families. And now we'll go to the first of the photographers we're going to talk about today. And this is Dorothea Lange. Afterwards, we'll talk about Ansel Adams, and finally, we'll have Toyo Miyatake. Let's start with Dorothea. She will work as a photographer, actually, for the federal government from 1935, and eventually, she will work in the camps. We have to say that although she had a position in this organism, she did try to make as many critique photographs to denounce the situation. Obviously, most went through the censorship of the WRA and they were absolutely put out of context. And many were taken away and were not disclosed to the public until these recent years. You can find lots of this material. Bearing in mind her situation, if you're asking yourself why 
didn't she do more? Obviously, she was restrained by her employers. But let's just read a quote to get a bit more of an insight. A quote from her says, Documentary photographers are not social workers. Social reform is not the object of documentary photography. It may be a consequence because it can reveal situations that can be concerned with change. Its power lies in the evidence it presents not in the photographer's conclusion, for he is a witness to the situation, not a propagandist or an advertiser. Our documentary photography has a responsibility of keeping the record and to keep it superbly well. So her job was to keep the record and I have to say she did a very good job because she knew that there wasn't that much that she could do in the moment but just her thorough documentation thanks to that we've got a really complete picture of the events that occurred she made sure the, to photograph the state of the things before the camps during the process of transportation of all the people to the camps so she did put a lot of emphasis in the protest signs of the people before they left their houses and their homes and with her pictures she does try to reinforce the idea that America was also their homeland what she does is she puts flags and objects that were typically American in that period and associates them with the prisoners. We'll see schools, businesses, people working in the fields, especially as we see in this picture. She uses children as a big reference because she did see them as clearly the victims of the injustice of the situation. If you have a look at the different pictures that you'll uh, find on this subject, Flag of Alliance pledge at Raphael Wheel Public School in San Francisco, this one, is one of the most recurring pictures on this theme in this period. But we have to say that this is only a fragment of the original picture. If you have a look at the whole picture, we see that it shows various girls of Japanese ancestry pledging to the American flag. But obviously, the solemnity of the first one is what gives the photograph such, much, such a power. And you could transmit the same idea with the other two girls with this broad smile even if it's beautiful and just as a note we do know that two days later after this photograph was taken they these girls were taken to the camps as a second photographer that took uh, pictures of Manzanar we have uh, Ansel Adams this really impressive photographer specialized in landscapes and it was in after the war in 1944 that he published Born Free and Equal. This is a book with all the photographs of Manzanar and we have a little quote from him just to also get a bit of insight in uh, how he viewed the camps. He said, I quote, Through the pictures, the reader will be introduced to perhaps 20 individuals, loyal American citizens who are anxious to get back into the stream of life and contribute to our victory. He obviously wanted to help the people there and his camera was his weapon. 
he had the chance to work in the camp because he had connections and he came in after lunch. He was also restricted by the WRA because they asked him, although he was a freelancer, that he could not take pictures of barbed wire, the harsh conditions or the watchtowers. But he was quite smart and he used various tricks. He changed the focus of the pictures, he inserted barbed wire shadows, he took pictures from the towers. That meant that the observer knew that there was a taller structure from where he was taking the picture from. And he taking whole landscapes, he actually managed to insert all the camp and just bits and pieces of what they had prohibited him to put in. Also, as we said, he used these iconic landscapes, these iconic landscapes of the American West. He linked them to the prisoners with this imagery of the territory. He gave or he wanted to transmit the fact that these people here were part of this American territory. And at the same way, he also outlined the American characteristics of his subjects. As we see in his book, he takes individuals and what he did was get them to frequently look into the camera because like this it gives the impression of interacting with the observer and trying to connect with the people that would be looking at these pictures. Lastly we have uh, Toyo Miyatake. He is a really curious example. He is the only prisoner that was able to take photographs before he uh, came into the camps, he was a professional award-winning photographer and he bought in his suitcase some lens. He was able to create a hidden camera in a lunchbox and just as a curiosity, before I follow up, I have to say that if you're in California his original studio still stands and is run today by his descendants, his grandson, actually. But let's go to his work. Because Miyatake's work is the only one, as I said, that was made by a prisoner, by an intern. And we have to bear in mind that cameras were banned from the camps and they had been classified as a dangerous weapon on the same level of any handgun or ammunition. But, as we saw, thanks to his wit and his knowledge, he created this hidden camera, not the one in the picture. We don't actually have it. But he was putting his life at risk. If he had been discovered by the guards at the camp, he would have been accused of espionage with terrible consequences. The reasons that made him create this camera were obviously the need to document the reality of the life in the camps. But you'd expect his photographs to be centered around the suffering and the tough conditions to report this but uh, he actually did not. Most uh, images show day-to-day -day life of the interns trying to create a normal life under the circumstances. We see groups of students, graduations, clubs, that kind of photography. The one reason for this is obviously that if he'd gone outside walking around with the camera, he would have eventually got caught and probably sent to some even worse place or 
you don't really want to know tortured and uh, taken into custody and God knows what else because remember there's something we sometimes forget in those days you've seen the type of cameras that they used they needed a long time of exposition for one single photograph so he actually had to stay standing still in one position for quite a while and that is just being a sitting duck waiting to be caught however there are some pictures that show the injustice of the situation this is his most famous one boys behind the barbed wire this boys actually did stage the picture they quickly went outside a moment they could they didn't use adults because it would have been really suspicious and we see one of the watchtowers this is one of the few pictures we have of them because as we said it was banned to take pictures of them and this is just a quick overview of the material we can find and the three people that worked in this camp Manfanar, trying to give us this resources to understand what was happening and we do see that the three photographers had this common intention what they wanted is to make the rest of the population aware through the photography that it was imperative to give back the rights to these American citizens because although they were of Japanese descent they were American and they had been stripped of their rights and put in the most unjustified situation with the families, with young kids just waiting to see what was going to be done with them and this is the end of part 2.1 the last part of this lesson will be part 3 so to finish up please go to part 3 if you're still into it today thank you for watching I hope you enjoyed and see you in the next lesson